If you are looking for a quick win in the garden, plant friend, look no further than simple lettuce. Quick to germinate, easy to grow, lower light tolerant, plus you can start harvesting way faster than the other traditional edible plants we grow like our beloved tomatoes, eggplants, and peppers. And once you start harvesting and experiencing that farm-to-table dinners, you will feel so empowered and get so addicted and want to grow more. I am so thrilled to report that Billy and I have not bought a plastic box of lettuce in months, and we eat salad almost every day because I've been growing lettuce hydroponically indoors throughout the winter, and I'm gearing up to start my lettuce garden outdoors as we speak because this conversation inspired me so much to grow a whole lettuce bounty on my balcony. Now be warned, plant friends, when you try your first piece of homegrown lettuce, you will notice the sweetness, the crispness, not to mention the wide variety of lettuces available in seed packets and mixes that you can't get in the grocery store, and it is going to be very hard to go back to soggy store-bought lettuce. I'm warning you. I'm warning you, but I'm also so excited to dedicate an entire episode to the joys of lettuce growing with a beloved plant friend of mine. So welcome. Welcome to the Growing Joy podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives. I'm Maria, author of Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, an epic plant killer turned happy plant lady. On Growing Joy, you'll find conversations about plant care, plant community, and wellness through the lens of plants. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Hello, hello. Welcome, plant friends, to the Growing Joy podcast. If you're new here, so thrilled that you're hanging out with me in this corner of the interwebs where we care for plants successfully, and grow joy by doing so. And if you're a returning listener, hey, plant friend, I have to tell you before we dive into this amazing episode on lettuce, big announcement, I'm a bird mom. If you follow me on social media, you might know because I've slowly started sharing Frankie, my baby budgie, publicly, but Frankie is the newest addition to our family. We got him in January. I've been kind of quiet about him because I've had a lot to learn as a bird mom, but he's just been such a dose of joy in my life, and it's been really funny. I know that I've briefly mentioned this on a couple of interviews, but Caring for a bird for the first time, I feel so similar to that first year of plant parenthood when everything was so exciting. I didn't know what to do. I didn't trust myself. I was always Googling stuff. And I just had this like explosion of love in my heart for my plants in this very new way. And I feel that with this baby bird. And it's just been so fun. His name is Frankie. Frankie is short for Frank Sinatra because my mom has a history of naming all of her birds after male singers because they're all songbirds. So Frankie is the new love of my life. There are a couple of Instagram reels about him if you want to meet him. He's really pretty. He's green and yellow. And he sits in my office with me all day as we grow joy together. Quick shout out to our newest members of the Growing Joy Garden Society. If you don't know what that is, it's our community app where members can get on an algorithm and troll free app to connect with other plant people literally around the world. We have members all over the world from Australia to Canada to New York to Europe. It's amazing. It's the kindest and plantiest corner of the internet. We've got monthly virtual calls, planty show and tells. We have a news feed where you can talk about houseplants, planty DIY, gardening. The app is completely searchable so you can see all of the posts. So if you need help with a fiddly fig. You can search fiddly fig in the search bar and all the posts on fiddly fig pop up. It's a very special place. So welcome to Brenda R., Helen Beasley, Isabel Motivans, and Kitty Thomas. So thrilled to have you ladies here with us in our app, and I can't wait to get to know you more in the platform. If you're interested in joining us, you can go to jointhegardensociety.com and then select the community plan to join us. Also, happy spring. We're like fully in the throes of spring here in New York, finally. It was just my birthday. I'm an Aries baby, April 10th, and I don't know. I'm feeling amazing excitement about spring this year. I shared something on Instagram that really seemed to resonate with a lot of you. So for those who aren't on social media, I wanted to share this concept with you here quickly before we dive into this episode. But as I was thinking about spring, the week of the spring equinox, I did this big meditation around the spring equinox and Something that came to me was, you know, in this season in spring, you know, the trees are coming alive, our plants are starting to grow again. You hear people talk about moving from winter into spring. There's like a lot of pressure to grow, 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 right? To hustle, airy season, all of these things I've been hearing. But when we sit and we really think about trees, 
coming out of dormancy and starting to bud or starting to grow, when we think about our plants waking up for the spring, they're really not hustling. It's a very natural process that happens because it's imprinted in their DNA and they intrinsically know what to do. So I just share, you know, in this period of rapid growth, which is so beautiful to be a part of, our plants aren't hustling and neither should you. Take that thought with a grain of salt if it doesn't resonate. And if it does, that makes me so happy. Okay, today's episode, Nicole from Gardenary. She's been on the podcast before for an episode on garden design. She's known for Gardenary Co., her incredible Instagram account and company where they make gorgeous raised bed gardens. But today, I'm having her to celebrate lettuce with me. Lettuce, the humble lettuce plant. If you are a houseplant parent who is curious about growing food and you never have before, lettuce is a fantastic starting place because if you have an apartment that has a sunny windowsill, you can grow lettuce. And lettuce is also a little lower light tolerant than our other, you know, famous edible plants that you know in the garden like tomatoes or peppers. So Nicole and I sing lettuce's praises for about an hour in this conversation. So I'm just going to cut to the chase. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited to go on this lettuce journey with you. So let's go to Nicole. Nicole, welcome back. Thank you so much, Maria, for having me. It's been too long, but I'm thrilled to get to chat with you. A lot has happened since we last got to you talk. Yeah, I'm trying to think the last time you were on the show, I guess, was 2021. We did an episode about raised bed gardening, and that was so long ago. A <laughs> time flies Yeah, now. we were still like in the middle of COVID and... Yeah, I was writing my first book. You had just published yours, and now you've got a new one. For those of you who might not know the epic brand, Gardenary, do you want to give a quick intro before we talk about all things lettuce? Yeah, Gardenary stands for Gardening is Ordinary. Our mission is to get everybody growing a little bit of their own food. We started in 2017, and uh, Gardenary is an online membership called Gardenary 365. The vision is that we eat a little bit of something that we grew every single day of the year, no matter where we live. And uh, and then we also certify gardenary coaches around the country and the world who help people learn how to grow a little bit of their own food wherever they live. Yeah. Shout out to my copywriter, Tina of Elevated Gardening is actually a certified gardenary coach. She's your copywriter? Yeah. Yeah. How amazing. She's the best. She has yeah, done she's- such a great job. She's incredible. She's enjoying her maternity leave right now. But hi, Tina. We love you. We miss you. Proud of you. Well, that's fun. We have a common friend. I love it. Yeah. So, you know, I think I first found you because of your tomato arches. So you're known for a very aesthetically pleasing raised bed garden that's very accessible. It's this amazing combination of like very clean lines and then wild growth on top. And I think I had found you from an Instagram reel of you growing tomatoes on your trellis. The tomato trellis captivated me. It still takes my breath away whenever I see you do it. It's my dream. I actually just bought my mom a trellis and we're going to do a a tomato trellis for her. You grow food, but you do it in such an aesthetic way. What's your approach in that way to creating such beautiful raised bed gardens? Yeah. So when I first started my business in 2015, I would go into these spaces and you know, talk to them about gardens. And we ended up just for the nature of what I do, I ended up in some pretty lovely landscapes. So first I was inspired by, you know, beautiful homes and yards that I got to work in. Uh, But I found that almost all the time the clients would say, oh, my husband or or I, we want to put this garden like behind the garage. (laughs) And just the assumption that vegetable gardens were like this sprawling, ugly patch that was unkept and not very pretty. And I thought, you know, that's a real bummer because food is like, it's our lifeblood, right? And these these foods that we grow in the garden, they actually are beautiful if you look up close. And so I kind of took it almost as a dare, like, could I make a food garden as beautiful or even more beautiful than ornamental landscapes? And really started trying to, you know, convince my clients like, no, let's not hide this. Let's make this front and center and actually make it the best part of your whole landscape. I read a book before I started my business, The Edible Front Yard by Joelle Yvette Solar. I read this and she talked about edible plants that are really attractive, like Swiss chard and eggplant and, you know, kales and things like that. I read this before I started my business and it was just inspiring to think, you know, food is beautiful and 
I think there's something in the human eye that our body recognizes and says to the eye, like, this is attractive. I think it did it for our own survival to say, like, you know, you want to put this kind of stuff in front of your face more often because it, it really is good for you. So yeah, that's kind of how it started as a dare. And also just, you know, from a marketing perspective, I thought, okay, if I can make this beautiful, I can have a a better business. And it just kind of went from there, being inspired by these beautiful homes and landscapes I got to work in, wanting them to make the food garden, you know, something that's, that's front and center for them in their lives and in their homes. And then just really being inspired by the plants themselves. Uh, You know, as you know, Maria, like the food garden, food plants are so dynamic. Most of us are very accustomed to perennial plants in our landscape, like a boxwood or evergreens that really change very little. They just need a little little bit of pruning, but almost all the food plants that we grow, um, especially the annual ones, ones that finish within a year's time, they go from seed to harvest, most of them in under 90 days. So that means we're getting to watch something go from literally minuscule, like a millimeter to like yards of vine and fruit within three months time. And I just think it's that dynamic nature of the food garden that honestly makes it so amazing to watch and enjoy and just like a miracle, really. You know, it's like it's like watching a butterfly form. It's like watching a baby go from newborn to toddler and you get to do it in three months. And so I'm like, why would we not put this front and center? It's amazing. And it's so good for our bodies. I love making beautiful food gardens. Man, I have so many thoughts about that. First off, the beauty of food, I think you're so right. And I briefly mentioned this to you offline, but I'm obsessed with the herb borage right now. I had never heard of it before, but then three different people recommended it to me in the span of a week. And that's always my sign from the universe that it's time to try it. Borage has like blue flowers and you rarely see blue flowers in nature. And I'm growing it indoors right now. I've got a hydroponic planter. It is so joyful to watch this plant grow from seed because I grow it all from seed. And then I have these blue flowers in my living room. They're also edible, but man, I'm drinking borage tea every day. I'm, I'm obsessed with it. And then also, I just wanted to mention Nicole in her 2021 episode, it was a whole episode on garden design and raised bed garden design. So if you're interested in learning more about these beautifully aesthetic principles. We'll drop the link to that episode in the show notes. But speaking of beautiful food, I'm so excited to dedicate an entire episode to the joy of growing lettuce. Yes. Because it's amazing. And lettuce is so freaking pretty. I mean, you think about lettuce, you go to the store, you think, okay, I can buy a plastic container of spinach. I can buy a plastic container of like a spring mix, whatever that is, or like romaine. But when you start growing the wide variety of lettuce blends from seed, you're getting purples, you're getting greens, you're getting dappled, like, you know, these heirloom varieties that have like green and purple and white, like all in one leaf. I mean, it's so beautiful. And once you grow your own lettuce, I think it's really hard to go back to store-bought because it tastes so much better. Absolutely. Lettuce was like my my training wheels for gardening. Mm-hmm. I had tried. I talk about this in my new book, but I, I had tried, like most people, I think when we start a food garden, like the most appealing plant. Well, you tell me, what was yours when you first started? Mine was basil. I've come late to lettuce, but mine was herbs. Basil okay, well, was see, my- You're smart mm-hmm. then. Like that's basically what I teach in my book is starting with leaves. I went straight to the tomatoes and it was a big Mm -hmm. fail. And so it was only a few seasons later, my friend actually gave me several packages of her lettuce seed. She wasn't growing anymore. And I was like, might as well try this. It's free. And the results were astounding. Like the plants were so prolific and I had never tasted freshly harvested lettuce greens before. And so I started looking into it and realized like, The plant itself, I mean, as you know, as we all know, like the food industry has taken a massive, massive 90 degree 180 turn over the last century. And, you know, and now basically all of our lettuces, if you're in the United States, 98% of the U.S. lettuce is grown in just two places, Salinas Valley, California, and Yuma's Valley, Arizona. So basically all through the year, it's grown in Salinas Valley until it gets like a little too cold there. Then they move over to Arizona and then back to Salinas Valley. So that's why when we have these romaine recalls and E. coli and all that, they literally strip the entire U.S. shelves of those plants 
because it's all grown in one place. So they can't, you know, differentiate. So I started like looking into that idea as soon as I started growing lettuce and then like really noticing the plants themselves and realizing just the nature of a lettuce plant, right? It's these tiny leaves, very fragile. It's basically like tissue paper. Like if you really start to look mm-hmm. at one leaf of lettuce and we know trucking, right? Like, I mean, we know stuff that gets delivered to us from Amazon or on a big box and things that travel far distances, they have to be extremely durable. They have to be extremely rigid, right? To make it through that kind of journey and lettuce just isn't that thing, <laughs> right? It's just, just by its nature, it's not that kind of plant. Things like a pumpkin or like a beet, those things can hold up under travel like that. They ne- not necessarily should. But when you start to really look into what lettuce is and just the the type, the part of the plant that it comprises, it's like a no brainer. Like this thing just should not be on a truck. It should be in a yard, on a patio, on a windowsill, because it's made to be cut and enjoyed like within five minutes of harvest rather than two to three or four weeks after. Yeah, especially if you're on the East Coast. I recently learned that too. And it's just crazy being in New York. I'm as far from California as it gets, right? So, and the nutrient value that gets lost and the the crispness. I mean, the first time in 2021, actually, was the first time I grew butter lettuce. Yeah, from seed, dang, the first time you try butter lettuce plucked off a plant, it's a completely different experience. I mean, it's totally different flavors. I'm excited to have this interview with you because lettuce was kind of confusing and intimidating to me. Lettuce plants get so big and to have a a seed packet and like not really understand spacing and when there's a mixture, is each seed going to grow a whole plant or is each seed going to grow a leaf? Like how does it work? So Before we walk through like how to grow lettuce, what materials do you need for lettuce? So lettuce is, I say, is such a good beginner plant. In my new book, it's step three. So it's actually a little bit more advanced than herbs or like sprouts and microgreens, but not too far, right? So only the third step. Really, you just need four things. So I do recommend not doing it straight in the ground, especially probably for a lot of the people we're talking to today They're not like rogue gardeners with a big farm set up. And the great part about lettuce is you can do this in a high rise. No matter what your setup is, I do recommend doing a container. Even if you do have an in-ground garden, lettuce plants have a very small shallow root system and they don't like to stay wet. And so they're going to do much better in any kind of raised bed or container garden They'll do much better, less pests, less issues if you just go ahead and put them in a container. So that's number one. The second thing you need is a loose soil. I like to use a sandy loam soil. The soil blend I talk about in my book is called the 103. It's basically like three parts, compost, topsoil, and coarse sand. And then I do throw in like earthworm castings. That's the 3%. So you just kind of pop in a little bit of extra at the top. So that's the second part is just a really nice sandy loam soil. These lettuces originated growing in a loose soil. They, like I said, they have very fragile, very shallow root systems. And so we don't want a thick, heavy soil blend. Next part is seeds. I do recommend starting all your greens directly from seeds. You'll see at a nursery or plant shop that they'll often sell lettuce plants Those are going to bolt much faster. You'll get one plant for the same price. You could get 100 seeds and you're just going to have an overall much healthier plant if you grow from seed, not to mention you're going to get lots more production from the plants that you grow from seed. And it's easy. It's not hard to start from seed like so many other plants are. And you don't have to worry about like what it's been sprayed with, you know? Yeah, exactly. Like the care, you're not trying to like okay, let me continue the care for whatever the nursery was doing. You'll know from literally seed to harvest everything that's happened, which is awesome. And then the last component, the fourth component is water. So lettuces are like 99% water. That's why shipping them is such a bad idea. So the water component is really important, especially in the first few weeks. I'm sure we'll go through the steps to growing, but the first few weeks are the most important. You don't want those seeds once they've been planted to ever dry out. So we're not looking for like soaking wet, but we are looking for very moist soil throughout the entire growing process. 
but the, the first two weeks are the most important. So you really like, I wouldn't recommend planting out your seeds unless you're going to be around those seeds for the first two weeks. After that, you move to like once every two to three days for watering if it's not, you know, too dry. But those first two weeks are really imperative. It's like a daily just soaking kind of thing. Yeah, that's a great point about not leaving because I feel like now is it's the spring. People start taking their weekends, you know, you plant seeds and then you kind of leave them and forget about them. You know, it's important to remember not to do that. Yeah, and it's different than a drip irrigation too. Like this is surface watering. So even if you're planting this in a raised bed where you have a drip system, you still have to come back by hand and water surface wise in those first two weeks. After that, the drip can take over, but before that, it needs to be surface. Thank you, Territorial Seed Company, for sponsoring today's episode. We're going to talk about their transplants today, plant friends, but on an episode about lettuce, I have to just take a minute. If you want to grow your own lettuce from seed and you're feeling inspired from this episode, Territorial Seed Company has a wide array of seed mixes, pure lettuces, seed mixes, everything you could want for your lettuce growing journey. And you get 10% off if you go to territorialseed.com slash growing joy. The 10% off will get applied at checkout. So wanted to say that. But if seed starting is not your journey this year and you're looking for the simplest, easiest way to grow your own flowers and vegetables without the hassle of a seed starting setup, try Territorial Seed Company's extended line of transplants. That's what I'm going to be doing this year, actually. I've used Territorial Seed Company for their seeds for multiple years now. I've had multiple seed starting setups. But this year, I have a lot of travel during the seed starting season in May. For me in New York City, that is not going to work. So I I'm going to go the transplant route for my grow bag garden this year just because I'm not going to be able to tend to those seedlings. And I'm so excited that Territorial Seed expanded their transplant collections because after last year, I am totally hooked on growing cut flowers. So I'm going to try their six packs of flowers. I'm thinking zinnia, snapdragon, calendula, and straw flower. I loved growing straw flower last year. Oh my gosh. And then I also love that all of their vegetable transplants are being grown in larger pots with 50% more organic soil for sturdier, healthier plants. I love that the starts are grown organically. Because when you buy starts from the garden center, you really never know what chemicals they're pumping through the soil of those little starts. I love their mini munch cucumbers, their baby eggplants, their prism snacking peppers, and of course, their tomatoes. Oh my gosh, they have so many tomatoes offered in transplants this year. I'm so excited. I grew a bunch of their tomatoes from seed two years ago, and Billy was obsessed with this specific variety called the blush cherry tomato. It is tie-dyed. It is the coolest looking plant. And they have it this year in transplants. I'm so excited. I'm going to surprise him when it arrives to surprise him with that plant. So order your transplants now because they're starting to sell out. And then Territorial Seed Company will ship them directly to your door. You don't even have to go out trekking around to all the garden centers to get what you want. Just order it at territorialseed.com slash growing joy. Get it shipped directly to your door and you get 10% off. So to get the 10% off, you just have to go to territorialseed.com slash growing joy, do your shopping, and then the 10% off will be applied at checkout. And let me know what you ordered on Instagram. Okay, so if you are planning a garden or if you have plans with your house plants for the spring, summer, and you need potting mix, garden soil, fertilizer, Espoma has your back. If you didn't know who they are, Espoma Organics is a 90-year-old family-owned and operated company dedicated to making safe indoor and outdoor gardening products for people, pets, and the planet. So as we're prepping for the garden season, you have to know that Espoma offers high-quality options for your indoor and outdoor plant collections. For those outdoor gardeners, you can start your seeds in their seed starter mix, plant them in your garden with their Biotone Starter Plus plant food that helps your plants grow larger root mass so that they can establish faster and also reduces transplant loss. You can use their large array of garden soils, composts, and potting mixes for whatever garden bed or container that you're gardening in. And then you can continue feeding your plants throughout the year with their line of fertilizers called Tones. So you start with the Biotone, and then you can supplement with Garden Tone, Flower Tone, Bulb Tone, Citrus tone, whatever you're growing, they've got a specific tone for it. And then if you're a houseplant parent, keep it simple with their general potting mix. It's so good. All my plants are potted in it. And then you can use their liquid indoor houseplant food to get your fertilizing going in the spring. 
To top it all off, Espoma has a huge sustainability commitment with a 100% solar-powered plant, zero-waste manufacturing, and eco-friendly packaging. To learn more about their indoor and outdoor products, visit espoma.com to see where your local Espoma dealers are, or click the link in the show notes to go to my Espoma Amazon storefront to see my list of my favorite curated Espoma goods that I use in my collection. In terms of seed selection, I love Territorial Seed Company. I grow all their lettuce mixes. Shout out. Love you guys. What do you recommend for like beginning lettuce? Is it as simple as like what lettuce do I like to eat and then I just try growing that? Or are there some that you recommend trying over others in terms of species? I like to put them into two categories. Really probably you could even do three. So the first is a loose leaf lettuce. These are going to be lettuces that you're growing primarily to cut individual leaves from rather than a head. So those we'll call loose leaf lettuces. Those are the easiest to start. And I'll give you a few varieties for that one. The next variety I call head lettuces. So these are just going to grow within one season. You could harvest them leaf by leaf, but generally we're more accustomed and you're going to probably be more prone to cut the entire head at once. Those are the most advanced of growing lettuces. And then right in between are the biennial leaves, the biennial lettuces or greens. And the biennial is kind of a fancy word that just means that this plant would last if temperatures are ideal. This plant would last two years in your garden before it goes to seed. So these are going to be greens that want to stay in the garden long term and will literally just continue to produce leaf after leaf after leaf after leaf. Those are right in the middle. So I'll go through my favorite types for each one. All right. So loose leaf, easiest one to start. Very few rules for this because you can grow them very tightly together and get tiny leaves or you can spread the seeds out and get larger plants. It's totally up to you and your spacing and and what you're going for. The smaller the leaves you harvest, the sweeter and the softer. The larger the leaves you harvest, the less sweet and a little bit crunchier. So my favorite ones in this category, arugula is basically a no-fail lettuce. So If you like arugula, this is a great one to grow baby leaves for. If you have never liked arugula from the grocery, you've got to try growing your own. It's going to taste much sweeter, less bitter and peppery, and you get to catch it at a much better stage of growth. So arugula is probably the easiest. The next one that's very simple, it's called Black Seeded Simpson. You've probably had this in like a spring mix lettuce container that you've gotten from the grocery. It's like a a wrinkly, bright green lettuce, and it's just a very prolific lettuce that grows very easily. The next easiest, I would say, is actually a spring mix. You've probably gotten it from Territorial. I have a favorite from Baker Creek called Rocky Top, and this is literally going to look exactly like the spring mix you're buying from the grocery. So you get the purples and the reds and the greens and the freckled lettuce all in one. And then the fourth variety I really like doing, it is a little bit harder, is spinach. Spinach is also a loose leaf variety, but it takes longer to come up from seed. It's going to take more like two weeks. But the quality of a homegrown spinach salad, oh my goodness, you're going to literally, you're going to be like, finally, I'm not throwing out spinach that smells. So those are my four favorite. Obviously, there's plenty more, but those are my favorite loose leaf. The biennial ones, my two favorites, there's more, but my two favorites are simply kale and Swiss chard. These both, you could start from a plant. So if you wanted to start the plant indoors, they take longer to take off in the garden. But once they do, you are set for like months on end. Kale turns into a monster. (laughs) It turns into a monster and it literally like in my Houston clients gardens, it's there for two to three years. I mean, it's astounding. Same with the Swiss chard. So like in my first book, if you see those huge Swiss chard leaves, those have been in those gardens for over two years because the weather is so mild there. So those, again, you can harvest a whole head, like you could cut the whole thing. But generally what we do is pull off the outer leaves and then the plant just keeps getting. Then the final category is the head lettuces. These are going to be the more, a little bit more challenging, not too much. But it's mostly because you're trying to get that head formation, and that's a little bit more of an advanced technique. This would include things like romaine or cabbages, or like if you're growing like a whole butter crunch head. So the fun thing to know about these is they can still be grown as a loose leaf, 
So you could grow a romaine and grow it just like the the ones we talked about in the loose leaf category, or you can try to get that nice, really crunchy head like we get from the grocery. This is embarrassing because this is like I've grown lettuce mixes before, and I feel like I still don't quite understand because I'm growing them in hydroponic plugs. So when you get a mix, like your spring mix that you mentioned or something, each seed in that mix, because there's multiple seeds of multiple different species, grows into a plant that's going to have multiple leaves that you're harvesting from. Yeah? Yeah. Same with any seed for any lettuce, whether it's in that loose leaf category, kale and Swiss chard or the head, has the potential to become a pretty large plant. So it's like houseplants, Maria, you know how like your houseplant could stay tiny if you keep it in the little pot or if you keep repotting it, like the potential, you know, is out the, you know, who knows how big it could get, right? So it's very similar. Now these lettuces obviously aren't going to get as large as like a monstera, but if you give them more space in the garden, especially more root space, and then, um, you know, if you wanted to give it a full quarter of a square foot or half of a square foot, it will grow to that space if you don't cut from it. And that's true for a tiny little arugula seed all the way up to a romaine or even a cabbage or iceberg. But yes, each seed has the potential to become a full plant if you let it and give it that space. And with lettuce, are you starting it indoors and then transplanting or are you direct sowing? I go with the category. So we started with that loose leaf category In the loose leaf category, direct sowing. So that means outdoors, seed goes directly into the soil and is either covered under a frost cloth or something like that if we've got really cold weather, or it's just literally out to the elements from the beginning. So right now in my garden, I'm in Nashville, and this is, um, we're still like a month or so out from our last frost date. I have arugula, spinach, spring mix, and romaine. They're all growing direct seeded from my garden outdoors. They've been out there for over a month and a half already. Not under a frost cloth? Not under frost cloth. They're just out there. So you don't have to wait for your frost dates to direct sow lettuce? All of these that we're talking about, they all prefer cool seasons. So they actually love to be in the garden well before your last frost date and well after your first frost date. Some of these will push through the summer when temperatures go up. But they thrive and really are prolific when the weather is like under 75 degrees Fahrenheit. So because I'm not using my frost date as a marker for when to plant, that's very exciting for me because my frost date is like June 1st. Yeah. How do I calculate like when it's time to start direct sowing? 60 to 90 days before your last frost date. So you're in it right now. Is there a temperature, you know, a nighttime temperature that I should be wary of? Basically, what we're looking for, for ideal planting time for any of these greens to direct sow, is that the soil is workable. So that's why we love raised beds and containers. So you really need the top four to five inches of your soil to be loose. Because they have shallow roots. So it's okay yes, if that bottom. Exactly. Okay. That works to our advantage. So even if you have a very deep bed, you don't need the entire thing to be thawed out. You just need the top four to five inches to be workable. So that's step number one. You can take the soil temp, you know, and see like, is it 45 to 55 degrees? I don't do that. I just check and see if it's workable. And I'm like, it's probably 50 degrees in there. (laughs) So then we plant and like the greens that I have growing in my garden that have been direct sowed, they have survived frost. They've survived a pretty heavy frost. Like we last week, I was out of town. They were all outdoors. They'd been in the garden for probably a month. And we went down to the 20s and we stayed in the 20s for like five, six, eight hours at a time. I came home and they all look gorgeous. So these are all frost tolerant plants. What you want to think about is the softness of the leaf. So the softer the leaf, the more they're going to succumb to like a heavy, hard frost. And then the tougher the leaf. So you want to think about like spinach or kale or Swiss chard, those kind of more Savoy leaves that are bumpier and and crunchier, those do even better in the cooler weather. So if you go really cold and you're going to stay cold for a long time, then absolutely you can put a frost cloth over. And then if you're trying to speed up germination, you can cover with like a poly, you know, like a plastic, a clear plastic that's going to let sun shine in 
but it'll give your beds, it'll probably raise the temp to your beds about 10 degrees. But generally these plants literally thrive 45 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit is the time when they're going to do their best. I want to finish up that first question to just close it up. So those loose leaf, I direct so, but also right now, Maria, you could, the head lettuces we talked about, and then those biennials, those are the ones I start indoors ahead of time. So kale, Swiss chard, and then things like an iceberg or a cabbage or a romaine, Mm -hmm. those I do start indoors to give them that jump start because they're going to, they take longer to get started in the garden and then they'll stay longer. So that's kind of my rule of thumb is the loose leaves go direct seeded and then those that get bigger and become a head or stay in the garden a long time, those get a jump start indoors. Okay. Oh my God. You're like getting me so hyped for growing lettuce outside right now. My yard is a beautiful representation of the spring equinox. It's literally half. We got two feet of snow last week. So it's half still covered in the remnants of snow and then half where it gets more sunlight completely cleared with green grass under it. So I'm just like uh, ready for it. But we still have some snow we've got to wait to melt. Okay. Walk us through from seed to my first salad how I'm growing this lettuce. Can I just scatter the seed bag or am I spacing? Like, how are we doing it? Okay, I'm going to give you the simplest way, okay? So you can make it more complicated, but this is literally the easiest way. Okay, so this is for if you just have a little space like along the border of your patio or your fence. All you need is um, 16 square feet. It could be a two by eight bed. It could be a one by 16. It could be a four by four. So you are going to fill this with equal parts, topsoil, compost, and sand. You can add some earthworm castings, and it's just going to mix it all up, okay? Just going to mix it, mix it, mix it, spread it out, make sure it's really nice and fine. You don't want a lot of clumps in that soil. Then you're going to take a probably two packages of spring mix salad. So I know you love Territorial Seed. You could probably link to one of their spring mixes. I love Rocky Top from Baker Creek. And you are going to put the seed in your hand and you're just going to rub your fingers together. I'm doing this visually like we're going to be on a (laughs) YouTube, but you're just going to shake the seed, like literally scattering it just like you would say like some oregano on top of a pizza or some sugar on top of like a cake, right? So you're just going to sprinkle them over the top. And then I like to take a little hand rake and just like rake it in. So this seed needs a little bit of light to germinate. So we're not covering this with soil. We're just making sure it all has nice soil contact. So you hand rake it in. I'll even take my hand and just place it on the soil surface, making sure all that seed has really good soil contact. You could also for bonus, just take a little bit of earthworm castings and just rub your hands together. I'm going to do this over the mic. Rub your hands together like this and spread that earthworm casting right over the top of the seed. Then you're going to take a large watering can. I like to take a two gallon can, fill it up with like lukewarm water. And I'm just going to lightly, it needs to be a watering can. Like don't spray hard. This is like a very dispersed Yeah, with like the rain top. Yeah, exactly. Rain top. And you're just going to literally soak the whole thing. Then if you want to protect it from pests, my favorite way is I just use little hoops and a mesh cloth. It's called ag mesh or ag fabric. And it's basically like tool, but it's a little bit more durable. It's like more plastic. And that just has these tiny little holes. Lettuce does not need to be pollinated. So we don't need any insects in this bed. So you do it right at planting time. And that's going to protect from moths and caterpillars, all the kind of pests that come onto lettuce. So I cover it on day one. Day two, you're going to come out, same watering can, pour it over the bed. Day three, same. Day four, same. You're just keeping that bed soaked as those seeds start to germinate. You're going to keep doing this. If you see water standing, obviously you're going to stop, but you want those seeds to be so soaked with water, they have to burst open and grow. By day eight, you should see tiny little, two little leaves popping up all over the bed. By day 11, 12, 13, you're going to see the next set of leaves popping up from those plants. Mm -hmm. Keep going. You're going to keep watering these. By day 22, 25, 
You should almost not see any soil anymore. The whole thing should look like it's covered with tiny little leaves. Okay. At that point, you can slow down the watering. You're going to slow down your watering to like once every two to three days. And then by day 30, you can start coming in and cutting. So you're going to cut from like the outside part. If you've done the scatter thing that I'm telling you to do, you really don't have to be very judicious with harvesting because there are going to be so many leaves here that you can just cut and they'll come back. For this type of variety, you never cut all the way down to the soil. You're going to cut, you're going to leave two inches or so, even three inches of leaf growth above the soil level. Then you'll come back and cut again from those, you know, in 15 or 20 days. So yeah, that's the process. And what I like to do in that four by four bed is I'll cut like a square one day, let that sit. And then the second day I'll move to the second square until I've worked through over 16 days, all squares. And then by that point, it's time to start back at square one and do it all over again. Sometimes I think about how much time and energy I spend making sure that my plants and my bird get the proper nutrition and water, and I am shocked always by how much less I care about what I put into my body. That's weird, right? Well, after completely neglecting my body for the last two years, gaining 40 pounds and struggling with PCOS, I have committed to putting my body and her needs first. In my research, I realized that cutting out processed foods and adding in plant-based, nutrient-dense food is the best way to do this, but I needed help to get started, plant friends. I needed a reboot. And that's where my three-day program with Saqqara came in. So if you don't know who they are, Saqqara delivers science-backed, plant-rich nutrition programs and wellness essentials right to your door. Their ready-to-eat meals are nutritionally designed to deliver results from weight management and eased bloat to boosted energy and clearer skin. Plant friends, I feel so freaking good after those three days. And more importantly, after the three days were over, I felt more inspired to continue this healthy eating lifestyle. Not because I deep loaded and lost weight, which I did, but because I just feel so good. Man, like I have more energy. And the craziest thing that both me and my husband couldn't believe was last night, I was out with friends. They ordered French fries for the table and I said no to them. Not out of deprivation, but I just knew that I would feel so much better for making the choice to not eat them. And my experience with Saqqara definitely put that into perspective for me. For context, French fries are my favorite food. And I just like turned away from them like it was no big deal. It was wild. So if you're looking for a reset like I was, maybe you want to jumpstart a lifestyle change, maybe you're just, you know, having a lot of travel and you want like a little program to de-bloat, or maybe you're just looking for the highest quality, most delicious plant-based meals delivered to your door, you have to check Saqqara out. And right now, Saqqara is offering our listeners 20% off of their first order when they go to saqqara.com slash growing joy, or you can enter the code growing joy at checkout. That's 20% off their order. That's amazing. Go to Saqqara, S-A-K-A-R-A dot com slash growing joy to get 20% off your first order. Saqqara.com slash growing joy. Okay, so I am always on the hunt for new podcasts to listen to, and I figured if you're listening to this podcast, you might be too. So if you're looking for another show that nourishes your soul, then you have to check out No Small Endeavor, produced by my friends at Great Feeling Studios and PRX. No Small Endeavor explores what it means to live meaningfully just like this show. In each episode, award-winning professor and host Lee C. Camp brings you thoughtful conversations with artists, philosophers, and theologians like The Office actor Rain Wilson and West Wing's Michael Sheen about what it means to truly flourish. If you need a place to start, I highly recommend their recent episode with New York Times bestselling author Gretchen Rubin. The conversation is all about what it takes to be happy day by day. So go ahead, plant friend, go follow No Small Endeavor on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and tell them I sent you. That's no small endeavor. Okay, so that's for the squares. Now let's talk about apartment dweller. Very similar plan. The thing you're going to have to be careful for is drying out, especially I think you mentioned a six inch container. So you might have to water it twice a day, especially you're going to see that soil surface on that container dry out pretty quickly. But you're going to take your container. If you can find a one foot deep container, I highly recommend that. And if you can find a one foot wide container rather than six inches wide, you're going to have a lot more success and you'll have to baby it a lot less. 
So I usually say one foot wide, one foot deep is like my minimum if it's a closed container, like a pot or, you know, a trough or something. I'm a grow bag gardener right now because I'm in a rental. What about a grow bag if it's circular? Could it be one foot in dimension or like what's the minimum size grow bag or circular pot I would grow? Yeah, grow bag, you can do the same thing. I've done grow bags too and same rule applies. I just find they dry out super fast. So fast. fast. Yeah, definitely. Literally. That's what I'm learning with my grow bag journey for sure. Yeah, I'd be gone for like two days and I look and like my arugula is like shriveled up and dead. Yeah. Um, It just turns very sandy at the top very fast. I don't know, something about the wicking of grow bags. So I would water it twice a day. And size-wise, do you think like a one foot in diameter is enough? You're going to have a lot more success if like, you know, those grow bags that are really wide. Yeah. You're going to have a lot more success with, if I was doing a grow bag lettuce container, I would rather a really wide one that's less deep. Then those really, you know how the grow bags are like sometimes over a foot deep. You don't need that for lettuce. You're really going to have more success if you have a lot more width than depth. And why is that? Because the plants keep growing their heads. So it's, they're going to get bushier and bushier. Now, are you thinning at all? Because if you're sprinkling, that's not going by the seed packet. I'll send you a link for this in the show notes. I have this lettuce that I did just like what we just talked about in a four by four. And I have a video of it all. And everyone's all the question I've probably done. No kidding, Maria. I just posted a video of it today. I've probably done like 50 reels and TikToks off of this one bed. It shows the power of lettuce, but I never thinned it. I just use harvesting as my thinning. Okay. You absolutely can thin them. And it's just like that concept we talked about. It's like the pot size effect. Like if you thin them, they'll grow bigger. But for me, I'm just too busy and it's not worth the time. So I just harvest and that's my process for thinning. Your approach is you're harvesting salad every day. And that is the fun part about loose leaf or even growing the heads of lettuce and then every day just going out into your garden grabbing a couple leaves of this, grabbing a couple leaves of that, and like making your own salad. It's the freaking greatest. I'm obsessed with it. You actually have salad you want to eat. It's like the weirdest thing. It's wild. (laughs) Tips for harvesting. Anything we need to be wary of. I loved your two-inch recommendation. Yeah. Don't cut down to the quick if you're doing loose leaf. Don't cut all the way down to the root. You want to harvest early in the morning. Lettuces settle overnight. They like absorb the water from the soil, the cooler night temperatures. It makes them sweeter. Mm So um, my favorite routine is like heading out with my coffee, cutting the lettuce for the day and bringing it indoors. Don't wait until like midday or the end of the day. You'll have a much sweeter, crisper lettuce. They don't store well. So I really try to do just in time harvesting. So only picking what I'm going to eat that day, unless it's a Savoy leaf, like the head lettuces or the biennials we talked about, like kale or Swiss chard, those will last, you know, longer, but loose leaves do not do well, like sitting out. So as soon as I get it in, I have um, a salad spinner. So I clean it off, spin it. And then if I do have to store it, I'm going to put it in like an airtight container, probably with like a paper towel or a dish cloth, like those baker cloths or whatever just to absorb extra water. The water is going to make the leaves wilt or turn bad. And then really just trying to eat them as fast as possible. So I I really try to do and encourage everybody to do a just-in-time harvesting. You'll have the best results. Then when you get to the end and you're just trying to harvest everything before it's time to switch over for the next season or whatever, then you might want to do a huge harvest. And if it's loose leaf, there's not a lot you can do to store it. But those biennials and head lettuces, you can absolutely freeze them. You can dehydrate them and turn them into greens powders. There's so much you can do to keep those greens and enjoy them year round. Yeah. Oh, I love the idea of dehydrating them. I haven't thought of that. Yeah. You can make like your own uh, smoothie powder. Yeah, that's so smart. What are some common mistakes you see people making? Okay, common mistakes, most common is wrong timing. So trying to plant these in the heat of the summer. Most of these greens really want to get established in, like we talked about, those those temperatures 45 to 75 degrees. Not planting closely enough. When we spread out our plants really far away from one another, they lose the benefit of growing together, which conserves water and conserve soil nutrients. So these plants actually, they do really well close together. 
Freaking out about pests is another one. Pests are part of organic gardening. It's not that big of a deal. If you have aphids, you can just spray them off with water. You can use citrus peels around your garden. Using the mesh cloth is a great way to protect from pests. And also just knowing like pests are just part of the deal. Like when I see caterpillars on my kale, I know that my kale is now producing more antioxidants than it ever has before because it's trying to fight off that pest. Mm -hmm. So just not freaking out about it. This is part of organic gardening. And it's actually those pests and the things that the plant has to fight. It actually makes the plant stronger and, um, and even better for us when we consume it. Not looking for perfection. It's not going to look like it does at the grocery store. And that's the whole point, right? These are going to be more wild. I have a whole video about this plant I grew. I call it the tallest plant, lettuce plant in the world, Lucy. And because it was an heirloom lettuce plant, it literally grew to like six feet tall. (laughs) And so really embracing the weirdness and the amazing, unique varieties we get to grow in the home garden and being okay when those don't match up to the grocery varieties. Hell yeah, definitely. You are, I would say, maybe borderline obsessed with Swiss chard. You talk about it a lot. You've got that epic picture in your first book of like the, it's like your back is to the camera and you have your like Swiss chard swung over your shoulder. It's like gorgeous. How are you eating Swiss chard? I don't get how to eat it. I understand it's a good thing to grow. I understand it's super nutritious, but how are you consuming it? Yeah. Okay. So um, my favorite dish is a Martha Stewart. I have this Martha Stewart book. I love it. It's called Vegetables. Um, And actually inspired my new book, Leaves, Roots, and Fruit. The whole book is based on plant parts. So like the first section is leaves, the second section is stems, and then she has a root and a fruit part. And uh, she has a Swiss chard lasagna in there that is absolutely divine. And I have four kids, and believe it or not, um, three out of four approve of this recipe. Do you use the leaves as pasta? No, you use it as the filling. So instead of a meat base, it's... Swiss chard is such a cool vegetable because it's really two vegetables in one. The stems taste a lot like celery and then the leaves taste a lot like spinach. So you get like, just like if you're making, you know, celery is such a common crunch, you know, in lots of recipes. And if you grow enough Swiss chard, celery, I think is much harder to grow than Swiss chard. If you grow enough Swiss chard, you can literally replace your celery with those Swiss chard stems. And they're Interesting. much prettier. There's red and yellow and purple. There's all kinds of colors. So I love Swiss chard lasagna, Swiss chard for wraps. So if you like making lettuce wraps, you know, make a hamburger with a, with a Swiss chard wrap. But even like veggie wraps, things like that are so good with Swiss chard. Baby Swiss chard, you'll find this in tons of spring mixes. You probably don't even realize you're eating it. But they put baby Swiss chard in all kinds of spring mix varieties we get from the grocery. So eating the baby leaves are very, Mm. very good in salads. And then I love doing like Southern style greens, but with Swiss chard. So you use the stems for the crunch. You saute that with some garlic, some onion, lots of butter, if you're me, salt and pepper. And then you throw in all the leaves. You chop them up really finely. You put the leaves on top and then you're going to put some vinegar in there, um, some more salt and pepper, cook it down. And it's just the yummiest. You serve it over, you know, like with some sourdough bread and it's a meal in itself. Yum. So good. That sounds delicious. Okay. So we've got to talk about your new book, Leaves, Roots, and Fruits. So excited about it. Your second book, What Makes It Different Than the First? Yeah. So Kitchen Garden Revival is all about the setup of the kitchen garden. I really take you through the process I refined doing hundreds of kitchen gardens for my clients. We go into plants in the second section of the book, but not nearly as in depth because the book really is to help someone go from zero to having a beautiful kitchen garden. This book picks up where that one leaves off. So it picks up with the plants. So Whether you're a beginner gardener or an experienced gardener, the point of this book is to really demystify plants, to help you understand how a plant grows, and then to give you a step-by-step plan to grow with your plants. That's kind of the catchphrase of the book. So the concept is that plants literally go through this process themselves. First, they grow leaves, then they grow deep roots, and then they grow flowers and fruit. And if we can follow along with the progress of plants, then no matter where we're starting as gardeners, there's always something that we can grow that matches our resources. 
So a key sentence I put at the beginning of the book is like, if you're not gardening yet because you don't think you have enough, and I go through all the you know excuses we give for not gardening, like I don't have enough sun, enough space, enough time, enough experience, then this book is for you because it really helps you find a plant at any given point in your life, whether you're renting or you're busy or you have a ton of space and time. It helps you match the plants that will grow with the resources that you currently have. So the vision is for someone from an apartment and, you know, a high rise all the way to someone with a big sprawling backyard to always know the plants that are going to best fit the resources that they have in any given season with a step-by-step plan for each one of those. I love it. I also feel like for you, it's such a smart book because... People might look at your Instagram account or your gorgeous raised beds and kind of get intimidated and be like, oh, no, 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 no. I don't have time for the tomato hoop. I don't have – like I am not doing a four raised bed gorgeous thing, which is like my dream is your four raised beds. To be able to crack your book open, learn how to grow lettuce on a windowsill, learn how to grow lettuce in my little grow bag garden, and then just kind of keep graduating with you, you know, and keep building up to that. But I I do feel like so many people don't start because they're like, oh, no, 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 I'm not a gardener. I can't do that. But I'm like, dude, if you grow a head of lettuce, or if you grow a pot of basil, you're a gardener, right? Like you're growing. Exactly. A gardener is someone who gardens. And that literally is the whole first chapter. It's done on windowsills and indoors. So You literally articulated the vision of the book when I got my deal. I told my publisher, I was like, my dream is that my reader buys this book when she lives in a high rise and all she has is a little south facing window and that she keeps my book all the way into her 50s when she has a backyard and, you know, a space to have more plants if that is where she ends up going. So Yeah, absolutely. My heart really is that all of us get to enjoy a little bit of food we grew ourselves. Yeah. And this book is meant to help everyone on that journey. Yeah, I'm totally that reader. I mean, I remember your first book, like sitting on my couch as I just moved to the woods, like pouring through it. I read it cover to cover probably twice, just because I was just like, just so excited at my first garden. And obviously, I wanted to be so insane with it. But being able to kind of be following you on your journey or growing with your education on my journey has been really cool. And, uh, you know, I still haven't gotten my raised bed for, you know, whatever you call it, the the four setup yet, because I've been renting longer than I anticipated. But you know, I'm taking step by step and I'm excited to check out your book and grow alongside you, friend. Yay. I can't wait. And you know, as we talk about this, like I have a blog post I did right after I wrote my first book and it was like five cities, 10 gardens, something like that. Anyway, I kind of track my own journey in the garden. And you know, my first 10 years of learning to grow was containers and townhomes and rentals. My whole first garden in Nashville 10 years ago was you know, just a rental backyard and us doing the best that we could. And I think I love the quote, start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. Yeah. And I think so many of us, you know, our our brains play a trick on us and, and tell us, wait, 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 wait. And we miss so much of the joy of the simple things. And I actually say this in my book that I put off gardening for many years because I thought I didn't have enough or I was renting. I was, you know, transient, like moving a lot of times. And I miss so much joy. Uh, And even now, as I have the biggest yard and garden I've ever had, I find some of the simplest joy in cutting microgreens to put on a salad or an omelet. Yeah. I think we postpone joy so much because, you know, our brain kind of plays this trick on us and tells us to wait until we have everything perfect. And honestly, that day rarely comes. A hundred percent. It starts with one pot. And yeah. once you get hooked, you will have a lifetime of growing and expanding for sure. Exactly. Well, where can everyone get the book and follow you? Yeah. So um, leavesrootsandfruit.com. If you just go there, you'll have see a whole page. We have a bonus course called Leaves, Roots, and Fruit that we're offering to anybody who buys the book. We also have a workshop that you can go to gardenary.com slash beginner, and that's a beginner gardener's workshop. So if your listeners love today, this will really help them to get started on their journey in growing food and kind of outlines the concept of the book. I'm on all the socials at Gardenary Co, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Pinterest, 
all those places. And then just our home for all of our information and blog posts is Gardnery.com. I love it. Go check Nicole out just to drool over the photos of her multiple gardens and how gorgeously aesthetic they are. Nicole, it's a pleasure as always. And I'm so excited for you with your next book. Thank you, Maria. Can't wait to be celebrating with you on Pub Day. Yes, it's going to be great. Thank you so much for having me and for being my colleague and friend in this growing space. I really respect all that you do. Oh, you too, friend. Yay, lettuce, right? Thank you so much to Nicole. She's such a sweetie. I'm in awe of the business that she's built and the thousands, I think, at this point, people that she's helped grow their own food. It's a great mission. Order her new book. Everything's going to be linked in the show notes. I'm certainly excited to read it as I devoured her first book multiple times. And I'm just so excited to get growing my lettuce. I've got my lettuce packs from Territorial Seed. You can get 10% off if you go to the website, territorialseed.com slash growingjoy. I've got my lettuce packets. I'm growing their lettuce mixes indoor hydroponically. That's how Billy and I have been eating salad every day, living room to table. But I'm super excited now that the frost date is approaching to get some seeds started outdoors on our balcony and to be harvesting all summer long. Let me know if you end up trying to grow lettuce this year. Slide into my DMs or my emails and let me know what types you're growing. And if you've really been loving the podcast, share with a friend. If you have a friend who you think might enjoy starting to grow lettuce or maybe a gardener who might enjoy this episode, share this with a friend. The way the show has grown the most successfully has just been with this amazing community of listeners who all want to grow joy together. They all want to keep blooming and keep growing joy together. I'm so thankful for you, my plant friend, and so excited to bring you another great episode next week. And until then, keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show so you don't miss an episode. We have incredible episodes lined up in 2023, and I don't want you to miss one topic. And while you're subscribing, would you mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review? Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so I thank you in advance for helping this podcast reach as many planty earbuds as possible across the globe. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got a ton of free options for you. First, there's the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's so fun. It takes literally three minutes to complete. You take the test, you get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you, inspired by your results. The link is in the show notes. Make sure to let me know what your personality is after you take the test. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, check out my website. We've got a bunch of free guides that you can download on topics like understanding natural light, which is actually a three-day worksheet, and nine ways to green up your office if you need to bring a little bit of planty joy into your work life. And finally, I want to invite you to join the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet, my online garden society. It's both a web platform and an iOS and Android app. It allows our listeners to get together in an algorithm and troll-free online space to swap plant care tips, humble brag about plant wins, and get support when you have plant fails. We have monthly live planty show and tells on Zoom, which are so fun, and even have a living library of planty book recommendations sourced from our community. You can go to jointhegardensociety.com to grab your membership. And for anything else, plant friend, I am here for you. Feel free to drop me a line, whether you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe you're even a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, following me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and tips is always recommended. You can find me across socials at Grow and Joy with Maria. Thank you again so much for listening. It is truly my honor and life's delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Make new plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app 
or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group. So if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section. Plus, the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar and literally every post ever created about Hoya will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click the community plan. Hot take plant friends, there is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. (music) 